todos, obrigada. Olá a todos, obrigada pela companhia aí, espero que tenham conseguido se organizar para a nossa troca de horário. Uh, vamos botar aqui na tela agora as instruções para as legendas, tá? Quem, quem preferir ouvir uh, e acompanhar as legendas em português, uh, vamos ter aqui projetado daqui a pouco uma instrução, né? O um botãozinho aí embaixo, eu vou agora uh, começar em inglês. Dr. Christensen is already here with us. Thank you very much. Here is our, our instructions to, to select the language, Portuguese, below the screen. So the ones that prefer to have it in uh, with the subtitles, please go now and, and change to have the, the subtitles available. So let's start. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Christensen, for uh, being available and sharing your amazing work with us here. Uh, for the ones who don't know, Dr. Christensen, he's from the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, uh, School of Public Health from the University of West Virginia. And Icelandic Center for Social Research and Analysis. He is the source to, to share with us the experience of the Icelandic prevention model, uh, uh, the model that we all been hearing about for so long. I must admit, I follow your publications, Dr. Christensen, since 2016, I think, 17. It was huge in Brazil. It was very much discussed. Uh, and of course, as most professionals working with prevention, we saw the, the whole idea of environmental uh, prevention, primary prevention using environmental changes, uh, very attractive. It's a dream coming true, reading your work, it's uh, amazing. And uh, I will just uh, give you the, the space here to present your work and we're gonna have in the end, some time for questions and, and discussing your work. As you said, society is the patient's take, and I, I loved your, your quote. And please uh, feel free to, to share your presentation. I believe it's already in the screen. Gabriel is here helping us with the management of the projections. Thank you, it's already here. And please, Dr. Christensen, uh, Go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me and see good now? Let me see. Yeah, this is in front of me now. Okay. So, can you see and hear? And is the are the slides filling out the entire screen? All right. So, um, well, thank you all very much. Thank you uh, to the organizers for the hospitality. I apologize for the uh, misunderstanding earlier with the time. It was a string of emails and I probably misread something. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to do my best to um, speak Uh, or keep the slides in Portuguese. Um, they were not um, translated by me, so uh, I won't take any uh, responsibility for that. But uh, I have talked about this for a good bit. And um, so I'm going to try to follow the slides in Portuguese and, and, and keep them uh, on my phone here in English, just to kind of remind myself where I am. Um, as a brief background, um, I've been working with the Icelandic prevention model pretty much all my adult career. Um, I started working with the Icelandic Center for Social Research and Analysis in 2004, so it's it's been it's been 18 years now. And um, throughout my <clears throat> my doctoral studies myself, 
at the Karolinska Institute and then my postdoc years at Columbia University in New York City and then uh, over in West Virginia as a faculty member at West Virginia University. I, I have kept working with this model in one way or another. We continue to develop the model more. We continue to understand more what's universally applicable. We continue to publish and we continue to uh, obviously to learn. And, uh, you know, in my earlier days when I was in Iceland still, I did pretty much everything there is to be done around the work of the model, including not only including the research piece, but also community outreach, um, meeting with and working with elected officials, uh, ministry people, local governmental people, policymakers, school level officials, uh, parental networks, and so on. So, so I've, I've done quite a bit, uh, probably most of this stuff in one way or another. Now today, um, my work for Planet Youth, which is now the home organization for the model and its implementation, and it sort of took over from the Icelandic Center for Social Research and Analysis, uh, I'm their um, chief um, quality and evaluation officer. So I basically try to keep, make sure that, that we are doing things right when we're working with different places. But as I hope to show in my presentation, you know, there are, there are distinctions and differences um, between the Icelandic prevention model and many other typical um, prevention systems. And my plan is to outline those here today. Some of the things I will say you probably already know. I'm sure you already know, but but that's okay. Those are those are things that uh, are just needed for contextual reasons. So what I want to do first is to talk about prerequisites. I want to talk about why do we look at things the way we do? Because I think that's very important for all our learning purposes, so that we understand what the model is about. And then I'm going to talk about the the sort of principal uh, parts or factors, one that we call the guiding principles and the other, the 10 steps to implementation of the model. And then I'm going to show you a few selected results and, and, and discuss those. So to begin with, um, the, the first thing we have to keep in mind is the division, this sort of traditional division between primary uh, secondary and tertiary prevention. And um, primary prevention is often called universal prevention. Also, um, the, the core ideas behind primary prevention, of course, is to prevent the onset of use. It's basically to, to, to focus or funnel society so that it doesn't create or produce new drug users. Uh, this is a long-term idea. It's a long-term frame that needs, uh, obviously, organizational input and a holistic contextual input. One of the things uh, we've done well back home in Iceland and we are now doing in multiple other places is to facilitate organizational collaborations. So this is possible. A secondary, uh, secondary prevention or secondary level prevention is, is, is typically through behavior change models or behavior change programs. Smoking cessation programs are pretty typical for secondary prevention. Harm reduction also typically falls under that. And um, tertiary prevention is then the mitigation of, of really life-threatening circumstances such as hospitalizations and treatments and, and so on. Now, um, if we ask ourselves, what is the most effective out of the three? Which of these three um, approaches is most effective? It really depends on our goals or our context. Now, if the goal is to prevent drug use altogether, then primary prevention is our focus. If our focus is to accept that drug use among the population of interest is simply a fact and will continue, maybe harm reduction approaches are what we want to work with. And if our focus is simply to try to keep people alive that are in life-threatening circumstances, then tertiary prevention is our focus. 
So the objectives of um, the Icelandic prevention model, to jump ahead a little bit, are basically to try to drive down the population level of substance use. And that means focusing on primary prevention. Our focus is to delay the onset of use among young users and try to bring them to you either begin their use later, including tobacco and alcohol, and of course to skip the use of licit or illicit drugs later uh, until much later. And there are all kinds of reasons for why that is a good idea. There's all kinds of research that shows that earlier use is much more likely to escalate into serious problems. And um, if we can delay the onset of use by a couple of years or maybe three years, we have really done well for our society. Um, there is an exponential growth in terms of risk when kids use very early. And um, we know that from studies in, in social sciences, in psychiatry and other medical sciences uh, across the board from multiple different countries. So the, the principle is this. We want to delay or prevent the onset of use as much as possible and move upwards that average age of initiation. Now, currently, if we ask the question of where do we spend most of our resources today, primary, secondary, or tertiary prevention? Well, far and away, in fact, 90% or more of all funding and resources to prevention is spent at the tertiary level, meaning that we spend most of our money, time, and manpower on treatment, hospitalization, and technical interventions that are very, very expensive, of course, per capita. So if our goal is to reduce population level use, use of drugs among youth, among minors, then we shouldn't be spending all our resources on tertiary prevention. So we need to shift that funding model to focus more on younger people and earlier levels of use. I want to underline that we have nothing against treatment. We have we have absolutely have nothing against the need for treatment. The treatment needs to be available and offered to people that really need treatment. But if our goal is to work at the population level and try to reduce the uh, odds of use, then treatment is probably not the best approach, then we should probably be working with primary prevention. Now that obviously ask, begs the question of, you know, how is this, does this function or come to play with the Icelandic prevention model? Well, we know, for example, as I said, that early use is most likely to escalate into serious problems. If we can prevent many kids from initiating drugs and provide them to with something else we can also uh, prevent lots of as associated or additional problems such as family and community breakdown obviously healthcare costs the cost for the judicial care system and um, policing and so on and so forth now the return on investment through well conducted primary prevention has been estimated to be four dollars for every one put in and all the way up to up to eighteen dollars for every one dollar put in so, so there's no there's no question that primary prevention if conducted well works well and it is if we think about population level issues it is common sense in our view now the central question if we are convinced that we are going to focus on primary prevention, then the central question becomes, how does substance use begin? Because that is the um, um, sort of golden egg, the issue that we really want to focus on. How can we understand what initiates or what facilitates the beginning of drug use among kids, among youth? And there are really three potential scenarios to this potential question. The first one is this notion that an individual makes a conscious and isolated decision to begin using drugs. This is under this scenario, we would think that 
a kid wakes up one day and says to itself, today I'm going to become a drug user. Now, this happens almost never. So that's not the principal reason. The second potential scenario for drug use onset is that the individual is forced by somebody to use drugs, either by peers and or their families. That's not very likely either. Surely family and uh, peers will influence them, but not forcefully. That's, that would be very, very rare. The third and most likely scenario, however, is that the individual makes a subconscious or an unconscious decision in the context of peers and social circumstances that favor drug use. This is the most likely scenario. In other words, a kid that lives in circumstances where drug use is common, a kid that lives in communities, neighborhoods, or areas where drug use among youth is common, is by nature much more likely to also use drugs, irrespective of character or personality or something of that nature. If they also live in an environment where not only drug use is more common among youth, but also in an environment where there's very little for them to do in terms of productive, pro-social, leisure time opportunities and so on, that in is that that adds to their risk profile. And unfortunately, as we know, these things often go together. Living in areas where drug use is common and living in areas where there is really not much for them to do. And we know that this goes a lot with socioeconomic distribution and socioeconomic background of the environment where they come from. But that's still a fact that drug use is not randomly distributed in the population and drug use onset is also not distri randomly distributed in the population. So um, the, 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 the situation is that today, uh, the, the dominant forms of addressing prevention have been to use inadequate methods such as focusing solely on treatment availability, even though we have our problems at the population level, or treat substance use among kids as a individually based decision. Now, individual decisions basically mean that we strip away all this contextual stuff. We, we basically remove the issue that where they come from really matters. That's really a critical piece. So as an example, let me just say this. I have never met a kid, and I doubt that you have, that could select their parents. It's also very rare that children can select where they live. And it's also very rare that kids can influence which school they go to. Those are all very important, higher level contextual variables. Who your parents are or the people that are bringing you up, which neighborhood or area you live in, and which school you go to. But those three are major influencers on the odds of dr early drug use onset. And when we work solely with what we often refer to as educational prevention programs, which is sort of the old fashioned common way of doing, doing prevention. We are basically saying that we just need to teach kids to shy away from drugs. We need to teach them to say no. We need to teach them to basically take responsibility of their circumstances, even though they may live under strenuous home situations, they may come from neighborhoods where there's nothing for them to do and drug use is all around them. And they may go to schools where they feel unsafe and drug use is rampant. And this is why it's so important to think about the environment as the producer of this kind of individual decision. And that is really in line with the Icelandic um, prevention model. So to continue, um, we need to continue to focus on environmental influences if our idea is to bring about population level changes. 
we need to shift some of the funding from 90% plus tertiary prevention and move that up to an upstream situation or upstream prevention, which is primary prevention. Let me give you another example. This is just a made up example, but this could be, you could read this in any literature into drug use. Let's say that we have two kids. We have youth one and we have youth two. Youth number one lives in deprived area with relatively high crime rates. Parents are separated and mom works two minimum wage jobs to make end meets, ends meet. She att he att this kid attends a chronically underperforming and underfunded public school. And peers are commonly subject to substance abuse at home. This kid also has limited opportunities for participation in organized extracurricular and, and recreational activities. On the right hand side is kid number two that lives in a middle class area with low crime rates. Parents are cohabitating both full time working professionals. Uh, this, this kid attends an average performing and an average funded public school. And its peers are unlikely to be subject to substance abuse or use at home. This kid has opportunities for participation in a variety of organized extracurricular and recreational activities in the school and in the community. Based on our knowledge, if I would ask you which kid is more likely to initiate drug use, almost everybody would point to the left, to, to kid number one. And the issue here is that we know this well before we move into prevention. We know well that the kids that are more likely to uh, initiate drug use, they come from certain types of environment. This profile has nothing to do with character or personality or anything of that nature. It has everything to do with the environment they come from. We could take another example and show you a kid. This is a kid. This is a. This is. A, I'll show you another example. This is a picture of a hundred babies. They're all um, at twelve months or less, or younger. Twelve months or younger. Now, if I would ask you which one of those hundred is most likely to initiate drug use, you'd probably say, "Well, that's not possible to know." No, that's true, but. If we would say, well, the first five kids live in a multi-deprived area and the next five kids come from divorced parents and the third row includes many kids that have no opportunities for leisure time activities and the fourth row includes kids that are bullied in school and so on and so forth. Now we have a, 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 a profile building up that can work for us. Obviously, they can't be bullied when they're only six months or less or, or, or something like that. But if, if they were in a, in a school, that would, that would be a problem. So what I'm saying is we can really say, and, 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 and it's kind of unfortunate that research has even shown that we can say as young as a few months old, we can build a risk profile for those kids. And we can tell, well, it's more likely that this kid versus that kid will be more likely to initiate drug use early, solely based on where they come from, who their parents are, which school they are likely to go to, what their siblings are like, and so on. So we obviously know that no kid is born to be a drug user. But this profile, this environmental profile, makes the world look quite a bit different for many kids. So, as a sort of a final um, 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 uh, argument about this sequence, let me just say this. The, the, this is a sort of a common type of, of uh, variable relationship um, figure that we see around. Now, we often talk about the causes of drug use. And the causes are very commonly these kind of individual characteristics. So on the left-hand side, we have the causes of substance use. On the right-hand side, we have substance use. Within this, this, this uh, square of causes of substance use are things like lack of purpose, uh, boredom, being depressed, low school engagement, and poor choices, making bad choices. Um, this is the, these are the kind of typical scenarios, the sort of typical explanations that are oftentimes provided for us. But we can also think about this in a different way. We can think about this as uh, something that's known in public health as the causes of the causes. 
So if this figure represents the typical sequence of causes of substance use at the individual level, this figure represents what we call the causes of the causes. So in other words, the causes of substance use also are unevenly distributed. And those are these factors that we call social and environmental risk and protective factors. The differences between where they come from, who their parents are, what kind of school they go to, what their opportunities are like, and so on. If we can work with the leftmost um, situation, the leftmost reasoning, then we will have less of the individual-based reasoning, which is in the middle, which will lead to lower numbers at the end. And that is indeed the focus of the Icelandic prevention model. It's not to focus so much on the individual, but to focus on the environment under the assumption that the environment produces the individual. You change the environment, you produce better individuals. So a few assumptions um, behind the model. Coffee. Assumption number one. Substance use initiation risk is not randomly distributed in the population. This is a fact. This is simply known. And as a result, we cannot apply the same type of program on any kind of environment. It needs to be environmentally specific based on what environment we are working in. Assumption number two, behavior change is notoriously difficult to accomplish. For those of you who work with interventions, I'm sure you already know this. It is very hard to change the behavior of people. And it is therefore basically illogical to assume that the best approach to drive down population level drug use is to wait until people begin to use drugs and then try to change them. It is much more logical based on this assumption that we want to prevent people from starting in the first place. And there's plenty of things we know about the risk and protective factors and the odds of drug use onset. Assumption number three, in substance use prevention, there are no quick fixes or simple solutions. But unfortunately, we often work in environments that assume that we can apply a grant program for six months or uh, uh, instructional programs in schools are quite typical. We apply them for, you know, a, a few months over a one class period in, you know, ninth and 10th grade or something like that. And then we simply assume that it will work at the population level. That, that simply is not true. We know from various evaluation studies based on individual level programs, particularly uh, what we often refer to as instructional programs, that they really don't work very well. Um, if there is an effect, it is usually a spike right after program implementation that then wears off quickly over time. So short-term programs are not likely to lead to sustainable population change. Therefore, we need to give it more time. We need to give things more time than we are used to. We need to we need to argue and justify and discuss with our funders and our bosses and political and politicians and people that make organizational and strategic decisions that 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 prevention should be embedded into our society. It should not be run solely at a programmatic level. Now, I understand that certain types of programs may work well in certain specific types of scenarios. But as a population level approach to reducing substance use onset, such programs basically do not work. So three pillars behind the Icelandic prevention model based on these assumptions and that what I have said already. Number one, the Icelandic prevention model is not a program. It's a process structure to form collaborative partnerships towards systems change. It's about maintaining awareness, empowerment, 
and knowledge so that we can create different communities that are less likely to produce kids that will use drugs early. Everything in the model is data driven. So collection of data and distribution and dissemination of data and the discussion of data and decisions based on data and actions and interventions based on data is really important. And collaboration is the absolute key and foundation behind the model. In fact, the Icelandic prevention model is a collaborative system. It's a system that really relies on the collaboration between researchers, policymakers, and practitioners. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So the goal, the goal of the Icelandic prevention model is population de level delay in onset of use. If we can delay our kids on average, let's say if we can delay onset of drinking and smoking for about two, uh, in a, uh, of about two years, between 14 and 16, for example, we will have done lots of good down the line, many, many years down the line. And there are numerous reasons for this. Two years of delay is not only just two years in absolute terms. Two years of delay is two years of brain in, uh, of increased um, brain growth. Two years is two years of, for example, independence. Two years of further growth and development in self-esteem and so on. So, you know, kids that initiate later, they are way, way less likely to escalate their use into serious problems. Now, in, in short, the Icelandic model is about integrating research with policy and with practice. Usually in our type of work, people that work in research and people that work as elected officials or policymakers and people that work in practice of prevention, those are very often completely separate. Those are people that work in different worlds. They speak different languages. They talk about different, they use different terminology. And as a result, commonly, many researchers aren't trained to work with practitioners or elected officials or policymakers. Many practitioners aren't very um, um, comfortable with looking at research evidence. And many and most politicians or uh, policymakers are just too busy to be much included, involved in um, collaboration such as this. So what we want to do, we want to get these entities at the table together. We want to create some kind of system, some kind of way for them to collaborate. And that's exactly what the Icelandic model does. Now, I'm not going to bore you too much with theoretical jargon here, but I just wanted to show you something that is important to, to mention in this uh, situation. This is a, a, a simple figure of a very well-known model in public health called the social ecological model. And what the social ecological model really da does and tells us is that individual behavior is influenced by multiple layers of the environment. It's not just the individual decision. Each of these layers is nested within one another. So each one influences one another down the line. And this makes perfect sense if we think about it. So in this situation or in this instance, the individual, individual child, as an example, with their knowledge, attitudes, and skills is only the innermost circle, the orange one. The blue, um, the blue um, um, circle around it, the interpersonal relationships points to the families, the friends, the social networks, and the sort of most immediate people that they um, communicate and connect with. Whether they facilitate further odds of drug use is important. Circle number three, the, the purple one, is the organizational circle, which is about social institutions such as schools, for example. It points to the fact that which school our kids go to is important. The green circle, number four, is about community, for example, which neighborhood they, they are brought up with or are brought up in. And then the red one is about national issues, public policies, state or um, 
uh, regional uh, influence and so on, which will influence them, but very indirectly. All in all, the goal with this figure is simply to showcase that individual behavior, especially when you're a child that cannot choose, as I said before, their parents, their caregivers, where they're from, what they do, uh, and so on, which school they go to, that's especially important for them. Now, the Icelandic prevention model really can be drawn up in this format to just be very, very brief. This is a, a figurative, sort of a theoretical figure of our main focus areas. The individual is in the middle there, and the individual is perceived to be a product of four major domains and situated at the local community level. Now, local school community is pretty typical because most kids go to school in the community where they live. So schools are representative units of communities. The four major domains of intervention are parents and family, the peer group, the school environment, and their leisure time or their free time. And the risk and protective factors that we assess in the Icelandic prevention model are all tied with those four major domains. And that is really the uh, idea. Now, <clears throat> we know that there are numerous factors behind each of those domains that have been assessed by researchers from all over the place, not just us, from, from people in the, in the States, in, in Europe, in Latin America, and in many other places. So it's certainly those risk and protective factors within each one of those domains are not just selected by us randomly. Those are established factors from solid research. Let me summarize this, what I've said so far, and then going to move into, into uh, something else. So the focus of the model is primary prevention. The main focus is on the adolescent social environment. Substance use is perceived to be socially produced. We focus on environmental change over time in relevant age groups, for example, 8th, 9th, and 10th graders as opposed to behavior change within individuals. I want to underline again, we have, nothing, we have nothing against behavior change programs. It's just not the focus of the Icelandic prevention model. We work with well-established risk and protective factors within the four domains, parents and family, the peer group, the school environment, and leisure time. And our focus is to use data and to collect and have a quick a system of quick and consistent dissemination and translation of annually updated results in a diagnostic and mentoring as a diagnostic and mentoring tool for policy make, monitoring tool excuse me for policymakers administrative leaders and practitioners the aim is to create a collaborative dialogue where we are all working together towards a common aim between researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to empower communities and practitioners to take ownership of their issues at the local level and to do this in a repeated fashion over a lengthy period of time, not just for six months or one round, but for years. Now, we have written up and published a, a sort of a formal way of working with the Icelandic prevention model through a series of papers that we published in 2020 in this journal, Health Promotion Practice. <clears throat> the first one is, is short and is about this sort of briefly about the history and origin of the model. Um, the, the second one is um, about what we call the development and guiding principles of the Icelandic um, prevention model. This is, this is pretty important, and uh, it really sets in a much more formal fashion many of the things that I have said already. And the last one is what we call 10 steps to implementation, and they are even more structured and formalized than the guiding principles. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about both the guiding principles and the 10 steps. So the guiding principles stem from both theory and research and what we know up to this point. The first guiding principle is to apply a primary prevention approach 
that is designed to enhance the social environment. So the isolating prevention model is about primary prevention and our, excuse me, area of intervention is the social environment. The assumption is, as I said before, you change the environment, you'll pr produce better or different individuals. Guiding principle number two is to emphasize community action and embrace public schools as the natural hub of neighborhoods or area efforts to support child and adolescent health, learning, and life success. In other words, we work with schools to both collect data and as a dissemination platform to work with the community and often also as places for community meetings. This is important because schools are usually a representative infrastructure in most places that can work with our approach. Number three is to engage and empower community members to make practical decisions using local high quality accessible data and diagnostics. So when we as researchers collect data, we quickly process those data and create reports, community-based reports that go directly back into the community. And those reports are um, sort of very user-friendly without any jargon and basically just about the main issues, the frequency and uh, the, the sort of averages of substance use and risk and protective factors and how these cross tabulate. And the fourth um, guiding principle is to integrate researchers, policymakers, and practitioners and community members into a unified team dedicated to solving complex real world problems. So a combination of guiding principle three and four is basically to use the localized data reports, which are produced both by the municipal at the municipal level or, or sort of area level and for every single school community and, and create an avenue for the collaboration between researchers, policymakers, practitioners, and other community members to make decisions based on what those data reports show. We look to the graph here, we look to this graph, we look at the risk and protective factors behind each one of the four domains, and then we make choices and selections based on what each community believes is the most sensible and important thing to work on. We usually uh, recommend that you only work with a few issues at a time, not too many, and then we take another round of surveying with our kids in schools a year later, typically, sometimes two years. And the fifth guiding principles is to match the scope of the solution to the scope of the problem. And that simply means to give it some time, to give it the time it deserves. Because we have this tendency, like I said, to think that prevention can be done quickly, even though we may have had many years of built up of problems, we cannot expect to turn them around with a quick fix program. Now, the 10 steps to implementation are basically a finer breakdown of what I just said uh, that can be applied at the local community level. So let me just run through those. If we think about starting to work with the Icelandic prevention model in a given community, Let's say that we have a community with 10 schools or a municipality or a region with 10 schools. And we're going to start working with this individual, um, uh, this one community. The first thing to do, step one, is local coalition building, identification development and capacity building. Basically, do we have a local team at that level that can focus on primary prevention? And an, and an important caveat to this is whether people or members of that local team have some time to give. Now, unfortunately, as you may already know, in primary prevention, we have had this tendency for a long time to assume that people can do primary prevention for free as sort of an extra thing in their free time. People that work in primary prevention need to be compensated. They need to be paid to do that. So um, step number two, 
local funding identification development and capacity building we want to make sure that we have a way to fund people to actually conduct the work this is very important number three is pre-data collection planning and community building we need to educate our community in terms of what it is that we are hoping to do as a part of the community building process we start in step one by identifying a group. Number two, identify ways to fund the group. And number three, we start educating our community members. We start educating others, including schools, including other places, about what it is that we are hoping to achieve. We create relationships with schools, as an example. And number four, we begin data collection. That, that typically happens in schools. Data collection processing and including data-driven diagnostics. While that is taking place, that usually is what the researchers do, the community team works on step number five and in enhancing community participation and engagement. We now go back out to the community and we start talking about and planning for dissemination, which is step six. So the step five is the planning process, plan for dissemination, set up, community-based meetings, set up meetings with parents, set up meetings with community leaders, with other organizations, with religious organizations, with leisure time professionals, with social services, with health services, and so on. In step number six, we disseminate the findings. And dissemination is, just, is not just sending the report to all kinds of people. It certainly could include that, but it's also finding other ways to share the findings, such as via social media groups, via flyers, via all calls, or in various different other ways. <clears throat> we then move, move into running a series of community meetings where we outline the findings based on our data collection, where we work with school communities and other organizations to basically show what's happening. And that means we have to explain the model to people. We have to go back to this figure and we have to show them what is this figure really about? Why do we focus on risk and protective factors within this figure? And what is that going to give us on the long run? Well, the fact of the matter is this. Kids that are in good standing and have good relationships and support from their parents or families or caregivers that have good friends to hang out with that aren't in any problems with drugs, that are happy to go to school. They don't have to be A students, but just, you know, they're happy to be in school as their main work site and have something pro-social and character building to do in their leisure time. A kid with this profile is very unlikely to have any reasons to initiate drug use. So that's the profile we want to aim at and focus on trying to build. So in step seven, where we have after we have disseminated the findings, we have held community meetings, we have really talked and engaged with people around us, we begin to set some goals and make selections for priorities based on what the results have shown. And this includes both people that work in, um, obviously, the coalition itself, but also others, people in the communities, in the schools, in organizations, and so on. In step eight, we look at current policy and practice in the area. Is it possible for us to either align or streamline or work with policies so that they are working with our goals and um, our plans to move forward? Can we adapt some of the goals that we have set based on the findings into current policy and practice? In step nine, we immerse our kids in primary prevention and interventions, including some environmental changes, activities, and messages. This means that if we have been successful with steps one through eight, we have selected typically three important community goals that we want to work with. And in step nine, we make changes based on those goals. Now, usually the first question with regards to interventions is, how much is that going to cost? Well, I can tell you that community uh, and interventions, they don't have to cost very much. We don't have to pay for a really expensive external intervention. 
we can also just set goals that are helpful for our purpose based on the little we have. Some of those, for example, could be, how about we try to strengthen the parental collaboration within each school and set up stronger parent communities where parents can get together and talk about what concerns them, including setting some common rules around what we believe is important for our kids. That's usually not something that costs very much. So in other words, we can do interventions and we can focus on certain factors between steps without really having to spend a lot of additional money. And step 10 is simply a repetition, usually annually, sometimes biannually, of this sequence. Let me conclude this presentation that I've already been uh, about just uh, almost 50 minutes. So let me just, just be relatively quick with the rest. But I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, uh, go through a few re uh, uh, results that, that are from actually from Iceland. So this, this um, uh, figure shows the trends in core measures of substance use in Icelandic 10th grade students. Those are students that are typically 15 or 16 all the way from 98 on the far left side to 2019 on the far right side. In 1998, 42% of kids in 10th grade had been drunk once or more in the last month. And drunkenness was a huge problem. And I mean, alcohol use was a big problem, but drunkenness even more, because as you know, when kids are drunk, they're much more likely to get into serious issues like accidents or or, or or violent incidences or do stupid things or bad things. So this ratio has been decreased from 42% to 6%, which is just a massive change in a 20 year period. Um, daily tobacco smoking has gone from 23% to 1%. We, we have e-cigarettes too, and we have certainly seen the issues arising with those. And now the predominant form of, of nicotine use is through e-cigarettes, but they aren't nearly as high as they were in um, 1998, and 17% in 1998 had used cannabis substances such as, such as hashes or marijuana, and that's about 6% today. Now, interestingly, if you look at the figure sort of just to the right of the middle around the year 2012 or so, since then, we've basically maintained a very similar frequency of use. And that's interesting because what it shows us is that in about a 12 year period, 12 to 13 year period, we basically changed our communities completely. Compu community norms are now totally different. And then for the last <clears throat> about 10 years, we have had consistencies all the way since 2012 to the modern day. This only goes to 2019, but the last three years have been very similar. So what that means is that kids that grow up as teenagers from 2012 and onwards, they grow up in totally different environments than the kids that were teenagers by the end of the 90s. So the norms are different. It's not normalized to be drunk all the time. It's not normalized to be a smoker or a cannabis user. It's much more normalized to have lots of other things to do. So a few uh, sort of simple indications of risk and protective factors. This is a rate of ninth and 10th grade students who spend time often or almost always with their parents or caregivers during weekdays. This was 23% in 97, 49% in 2018. Um, parental monitoring, my parents know where I am in the evenings. These are only the ones that say that it applies very or rather well to them. And this was 52% in 2000 and 77% in 2018 and dropped a little bit from 2016. So in short, this has increased quite a bit also which is an indication of a changed society. In 2000, 23% of our kids said that they participated in sports with a team or club four times a week or more often. Sports in Iceland are not organized around schools. They're organized as sort of area-based clubs that are supported by the municipalities. And we know in our environment that formalized organized sports where you have professional trainers and professional people behind the scenes they are very pre pre preventive and protective for um, substance use onset. So this has been this has been 
this has risen almost almost double from 23 to 43% in an 18 year period. And to begin with, uh, out late outside hours, in 2000, 53% of our kids had been outside after 10 o'clock in the evening, three times or more often in the last week. This is now down to 22%. So you see that there's a massive shift in unsupervised late outside hours as well. Let me end this by showing you something that is less relevant to the surveys, but more relevant to the population level changes. This is These um, two lines represent the proportion of young men, the yellow line for men aged under 20, and the red line for men aged or kids or, or youth, excuse me, aged under 18, that had been to drug treatment ever in their life. Um, based on uh, an annual report by the main treatment center in the city of Reykjavik. Now, the x-axis that shows the years, those are birth cohorts. So for the 1982 birth cohort, for example, if you focus on the yellow line, they were 20 years old in 2002. So in 2002, for those that were 20 years old or younger, uh, about 5.7% of them had been to drug treatment. And SAA is far and away the largest treatment center in Iceland. So this, these are pretty reliable over time. If you look at the end of the yellow line, you see for the 1995 cohort, that's the cohort that were 20 year old in 2015. So 82 to 95 basically represent the years between 2002 and 2015. Then the frequency of, 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 of uh, young men aged under 20 coming to treatment was about 2.7%. So in other words, by focusing on this figure, by focusing on risk and protective factors and working with the Icelandic prevention model, the processes behind the model, strengthening our communities and driving down the odds of drug use, we have not seen, not only have we seen improvement in known risk and protective factors and substance use such as this, we have also seen that needs for drug treatment have massively redu been reduced. In other words, we have more than halved our need for drug use treatment for young men. And as you probably know, drug use treatment is one of the least productive, effective, excuse me, and most expensive ways of trying to prevent substance use. So we are saving a lot of money in the system by reducing the need for drug use treatment and focusing more on the environment. I just ended with a list of publications that we have. We have published all kinds of things about the model over time, but you know, if you're interested, many of these are in open access and in uh, open format, and, and you, can, you can acquire those if you're, if you're interested. I can also send them to you. Uh, I apologize for going over the time but uh it's just so much fun to talk about this all the time so um i think we have some time for questions thank you very much thank you very much for the amazing presentation dr christensen it was great to hear you it was uh such a great pleasure to to see from the source all those results I just thank you also in the name of our Brazilian Association of Studies in Alcohol and Other Drugs, ABEADI. And, and we should now open for questions uh, the, to our audience. You can send the questions in Portuguese. Vocês podem mandar as perguntas em português, tá? que eu, eu traduzo para o para o nosso convidado. Uh, o Gabriel está aqui para poder nos ajudar nessa intermediação. Nós já temos algumas perguntas aqui. Uh, eu vou até copiar. Uh, antes, antes de abrir para fora, eu queria tomar a liberdade. Before I open the questions to, to, to the audience, we already have one here waiting. I, I would love to hear your point of view about, I think it's the question everybody wants to ask you, right? As a Brazilian audience, uh, how you see our greatest challenges here, which are mostly uh, related to our 
not only size, I think size is it's the obvious uh, question. We are huge, you know, Sao Paulo State is, if it's almost 30 Iceland in Sao Paulo State only, it's crazy. But I, I don't see that as such a big challenge as the whole point of alcohol regulation. You probably know this is our main gap here. Uh, we have a massive industry influence in our legislations. We have uh, a, a very hard time trying to implement the basic, the most basic uh, regulations. Like we don't have alcohol retail uh, um, uh, density regulations. We don't even have licenses. Did you know that? We don't have license to sell alcohol, which is insane. For most people in Europe, when I say that, they, they get shocked. We don't need a license, a specific license. So we cannot regulate who is selling, we have informal selling, which I see as our greatest challenge to implement any environmental approach. So I would love to hear your point of view uh, um, about that. Uh, maybe you know some some insights about how to go on you know to 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 do this alignment as you said in the steps uh, of action that i really liked but but there's one step there that I, i'm sure brazilians will will face and get stuck which is how to align the policies and the regulations in our favor with such an influence of of our industry so if you could if you could Give us your point of view about this one, um, you know, challenge in transferability, you know, to uh, to make it replicable in our context. It would be great. And then I can I can translate the, the following question that just came up. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Well, obviously, I'm not a professional in um, Brazilian geography. I know it's a very big country and and um, Obviously, each country has their own particular issues and so on. Um, in my and our collaboration with some other Latin American countries, we have seen that the alcohol lobby is very, very strong. And um, it, it seems to be pretty normalized that kids initiate alcohol use very early. Well, the first thing that I would say is, well, you have to start somewhere. You know, we, we, we can't let the current situation basically take away all our efforts and just say, well, it doesn't matter now. So we have to start somewhere. And um, <clears throat> what, I would, what, what I would recommend is really focus on the early steps for a while. You know, don't expect that to change overnight. Um, adjusting policy is something that comes later on. And in fact, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. We're working on a certification system for the Icelandic prevention model. And the certification system is going to assume that you work with a model for at least five years. That's way longer than most interventions typically last because the idea is that you slowly but surely you work towards environmental change. Assuming that that's going to work well, I would focus very, very strongly on the first steps uh, for a, a, a a, an extended period of time, building those local teams well, making sure that they are funded and that they have the capacity to move forward, learn how to read the data, learn how to educate our community about what the data actually shows. I know for a fact that most parents and caregivers in Brazil love their kids just as much as they do elsewhere. But maybe they don't know what alcohol does to the developing brain. So maybe that is where we would start by initiating interventions that have to do with parental education. That may be something that we need to start with. We're not gonna attack the alcohol industry. We're not gonna be able to be successful doing that. That's quite obvious, but if we are going to try to build some momentum, we just have to focus very carefully on the first steps to begin with. We don't have to jump into anything. This is a very common um, question with regards to, you know, Iceland is small, it's really easy to implement and so on and so forth. All of that is true. But 
the organizational structure of most countries actually is quite similar. And I can tell you that we've collected data in over 30 countries and the relationship between risk and protective factors and outcomes is always the same. Even here where I live in rural America, in rural West Virginia, the risk and protective factors that we observe here, which are the same, they focus and function absolutely the same. So, you know, when I come here as a foreigner with a different name, uh, you know, I have an accent. Well, you, you think I sound American, but they hear they will tell me you have a funny accent. Where are you from? So I will I will I will talk about that. And of course, I have a funny name and so on and so forth, too. But when we do these measurements, people will often say, well, I think our environment is a little bit different. Our kids are a little bit different. Well, it turns out that they're not. They are actually very similar to kids everywhere else. So, you know, I don't. I, I, there's no patent solution to this. There's not a single answer. But the, the main thing is follow the guiding principles, which tell you take some time. Don't expect it to go happen overnight. Focus strongly on the team building at the local level and make sure that they are funded and capable to actually do this kind of work. When it comes to the data collection, people should be ready to be able to learn. And then we can make the most of our decisions moving forward. If, if, if step eight is particularly difficult to begin with, that is the policy and practice alignment, there may be parts in there that we can still work with. For example, in this country, we have something called school improvement plans. And what the schools tend to do with that is to try to create plans of improvement around not only learning, but also social activities. One of the things that uh, we initiated at home and has been really well received, both by parents and others, was, for example, to prevent kids from drinking in school-based gatherings. That seems to be a pretty simple step to take. Most people will agree that that's okay. Uh, even, you know, people that that allow their kids to drink. So that was the original first step. So this is a slow moving target. Excellent. So advocacy, advocacy to change normalizations, norms in, in regarding banalization, banalizing right, alcohol. Right. Right. Use. And focus on advocacy for a while. I mean, that is that is we can't jump into nothing. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just call the audience to send their questions. I think the question, uh, the previous question was answered. It was totally answered by, by your, your saying. Uh, any more questions? Pessoal, say, mandem as perguntas aqui para eu poder traduzir para o Dr. Christensen. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just keep asking, right? You know, you know, getting, getting the, translating the answer. Okay. Okay. So, uh, excuse me, Dr. Christensen, I'll, I'll just try to summarize your answer. So, they're asking me to, to translate the, the answer. Uh, acho que o que o, o que o professor trouxe como resposta desse, desse nosso desafio gigante, que é a, 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 né, a transposição, é que, e que essa questão de, de políticas públicas estarem contra a gente, né? A gente tem um grande desafio aí com regulamentação de álcool, que é um passo que está ali, parte do, do passo a passo do modelo, e que para a gente, a gente sabe que não vai ser tão simples. Ele trouxe a importância de advocacy, de conseguir mudar as pequenas comunidades, os pequenos grupos, uh, mexer com as normas sobre consumo precoce, e trabalhar essa... essa ele falou principalmente em parentalidade, né, o quanto que essas mudanças em conhecimento de efeito do álcool precoce, conhecimento da importância de monitoramento, seria um primeiro passo a se tomar e que nada vai ser atingido, né, em curto prazo. Sorry, Dr. Christensen, I, I just tried to put it all together, uh, your answer, I think, I think it was... It was enough. We have Lidiane here, our partner uh, from, from Ceará. She's asking uh, what you consider as a short term. Here in Brazil, we have programs, uh, prevention programs that will evaluate, you know, uh, in a long term 
So what would you consider specifically a short term? Do you think uh, you believe in the... In the um, uh, she's asking whether you believe or not in, in the idea of programs and not uh, necessarily uh, the structure of the process. That's Ligiani's question. Thank you. Very good question. Yeah, well, let me put it this way. I am strongly supportive of programs that are targeted and that work for specific audience. But that's just not how prevention is very often conducted. So let's, let me give you an example. When prevention has acquired a name for itself and it becomes something that people think is important, we have a way to funnel the attention of prevention through our official systems like the schools. So our politicians, they will make decisions and say, well, you know, we need to do prevention. And then they will say, well, let's dump it on the schools. That's the simplest thing to do. Now, the schools are busy. The schools have lots of other things to do. They are supposed to educate our kids. So what they will do is that they will often select something that is totally ineffective, like getting a sober person to come in and tell war stories for half a day or try to sh try to scare the kids about you know all the bad stuff that's out there or things of that nature. We also know that schools oftentimes tend to use very short-term programs because it facilitates their needs, not the needs of the community, but they can check a box. Prevention done this year, now let's move to something else. So it's the structure of prevention that is oftentimes the problem that we have, are faced with. We stopped operating with those instructional programs in schools back home when we shipped our focus or switched our focus over to community-based implementation. And it certainly hasn't um, hurt us. Now, there are other programs around. Um, there's a really well-known program here in the States called the D.A.R.E. program that you may have heard of. It's, it's, it's exclusively um, delivered by policemen and by, by law enforcement agents. And it's really about, it's really an instructional educational approach, you know. Unfortunately, it's been evaluated numerous times to be completely ineffective, but it's still one of the more common programs around. So I don't want to pinpoint the D.A.R.E. program particularly. I just want to say, if we are going to run programs, maybe they are better targeted after we have understood where they are mostly needed. So if we take account of communities, schools, and areas, and we look at the distribution of them, I'm quite sure that the same single program is not going to be helpful in every single place. So if we apply a structure like the Icelandic prevention model, it will give us an opportunity to differentiate and separate the areas that need certain types of interventions versus other areas that may need some other type of intervention. So the idea is that, that we try to prioritize more and be more effective based on need, based on some underlying need. So I think that's really the best answer to the question. Excellent. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll just um, comment that I totally agree with you. Uh, we have that uh, as a massive problem to, to, to follow the evidence in the school-based programs implementations. Um, and I'll try to translate your answer here. Um, uh, o professor vai ter que voltar essa pergunta, tá, gente? Uh, Gabriel, se você puder botar de volta, porque eu não consegui ler ela toda, ela tá grande, eu vou traduzir a primeira resposta dele. Então, o que o professor uh, Christiansen respondeu, ele trouxe muito em que a, a questão para responder a Lidiane a questão de uso de estratégias não efetivas né, na, na, na aplicação de prevenção nas escolas. Ele, ele usou o termo, né, dump, né, ele joga lá na escola uma coisa que vai ser mais fácil, que daí a gente tem essa né, tarefa cumprida, botando qualquer tipo de intervenção na escola. Ele citou né, o quanto que é inefetivo o uso de palestras, né, só sobre os danos, como mencionou o quanto que é inefetivo o uso de amedrontamento como uma estratégia. Se tudo isso que a gente sabe, né, que está totalmente já 
uh, caiu por água abaixo através dos estudos de evidência, citou o DARE, que é o programa americano, né, que, na verdade, uh, foi a origem do nosso PROERD, né, embora o DARE tenha evoluído lá, é o Keeping It Real, né, o programa que... que que evoluiu, ele não mencionou, mas ele falou do quanto que, de fato, programas inefetivos ou sem resultado, até iatrogênicos, né, eles acabam sendo uh, replicados em escolas e o quanto que essa, essa, esse uso de estrutura, né, uma coisa mais estrutural e ambiental seria mais efetivo. Queremos priorizar a prevenção do uso, redução de danos ou tratamento. Nessa fala não considera Uh, a Claudine, uh, she's, uh, she's asking uh, about one of your slides that compares the, the, uh, the three options of uh, intervention, primary, uh, secondary, and tertiary, talking about harm reduction and treatment. Uh, and then she's asking uh, whether you, you consider harm reduction as an approach in the treatment uh, treatment approach. I think I th I'll try to explain better. In Brazil, we have a massive, um, uh, and in my opinion, completely nonsense discussion uh, where we put harm reduction and treatment as if they were, you know, opposite. And there is a huge political, you know, um, uncomfortable discussion that leads to nothing, uh, which is whether to use mainly harm reduction or treatment. And uh, I'll just try to, to mention, I, I don't know if you want to comment something about that. I think it's escaping a little bit from, from the, the idea that you bring in that it's primary prevention as an approach. Do you have any comments on that? Well, just briefly, I mean, that's correct. It's not in line with our um, thinking. It's, it's really, we, we don't have any against uh, harm reduction or, or treatment for that matter. I mean, it's very important to keep treatments well-funded. What we just need to do is to try to think upstream and prevent people from needing to come to treatment. I mean, that would be the logical thing to do. But harm reduction has been gaining um, um, attraction and focus in, in most places, including where I come from. And, and And some of it is, is I think, well, very well warranted. I would never put harm reduction as an opposite to treatment. I don't think these things necessarily have to be, to be um, um, the sort of odd ends of the same thing. There's also, at least where I come from, there, there's a lot of confusion between, for example, uh, what we would call decriminalization or legalization. There's there's a lot of, of uh, really kind of misleading discussion around those two. And it's, as you know, the minute you mention drugs, the political theater just kind of grows up and everybody has an opinion and everybody wants to say this and that. And, and people think about this in a, in a matter of uh, a political uh, capital, political constituents and so on. But for me, Harm reduction can work well when you are in a situation where that is absolutely needed. So, for example, if we want to um, spend our resources more where they are direly needed, maybe we should stop, you know, taking people with very, very little on them and constantly focusing on, 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 on that kind of policing. I mean, that's one thing. Uh, a different terminology about people that use drugs is another. Um, why would we necessarily labelize and stigmatize people so that they are more likely to go into the dark corners of society instead of simply saying, well, if you're a drug user, okay, we're here to help if you want to. And so, you know, we know that plenty of those programs like needle exchange programs, they actually work very well. They work if they are implemented correctly. I just had an example here in my state where they had a really well-functioning needle exchange program. It was driving down the HIV prevalence in the state. And then some politician came around and said it was dirty needles all over the place for their kids. They shut down the program and our HIV prevalence just spiked again. So, I mean, you know, we have this kind of nonsense almost everywhere. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'll just ask to put back uh, another question. In the meantime, I would love to hear your views on uh, strategies or, or maybe, you know, uh, some, some 
uh, insights about how to deal with the lack of resources we have here. Because, you know, we have some communities that we are struggling to have the basic, basic resources for, you know, housing and and feeding our kids. And and then it comes to me always when I when I read your work, it comes to me, oh my God, how could we make leisure sports facilities available in our context? It's a, a huge storm here. Just take my microphone out and and uh, perfect. I think Ligiani's question here, it's exactly the what I'm mentioning. It's how would you see the possibilities of how to apply uh, the funding into into leisure or sports facilities? Well, as I said in the beginning, we, we, we need to do our preparation work well. And when we do our preparation work well, we create relationships with people that make key decisions, like politicians, for example. Now, most politicians probably agree that early alcohol use or drug use among kids is not good. If we can work with that as a base, then we have some to build on. It will be our job to educate them about what is effective in drug use prevention. Now, if they agree that, well, early alcohol use is bad for the developing brain, kids are way more likely to drop out of school and become risk takers in life. And um, we don't want them to become the next generation of, of drug users. So what can we do about that? Well, one of the healthier ways to do about uh, prevention at that level as a primary source is to have our politician come to understand that if we can keep them socially occupied in pro-social and character building activities, then we can also contribute really heavily towards primary prevention. And one of the things, so for example, if we think about the backstory of the Icelandic model, we really started by building infrastructure. And the way we built infrastructure was, well, a few, a few things. We created these communities of groups of people in every single municipality that we will be working with. And they had sub teams of people within every school that we would be working with. Now, not all schools or all municipalities are going to do this, but you know, let's say that we are working with a few and, and everybody plays into that. We then were able to acquire funding to hire primary prevention experts in each municipality. So in that respect, you have an individual or a team of people that creates a link to the research site. So, so there's, there's, there's a network of people that are already communicating about the research piece. Now we have a way to start creating relationships with the schools and facilitating their interest in trying to move on with the data collection. Once the data collection systems were set up, we had something to give. And one of the things that is really powerful about practical data is to show it to and work on it with our politicians. Because if we put our politicians against one another, if we tell them, well, listen, I've got this distribution of drug use across different communities, and I see that there's this one community that stands out all the time, that's your community. Do you want your kids to continue to use drugs all the time? Or are, are you planning or willing to work with us moving forward? They oftentimes will listen. The data in that way is more than just a, a sort of a, an avenue or a compass as a guiding compass. It also is a tool that helps us facilitate and bring in decision makers and make decisions about resources. This is hard to do to begin with. It's hard to create that kind of network and it's hard to get people to listen. And that's why this repetition is so important that you do this year after year, after year after year, you're always bringing this data. You're always showing this distribution. You're always showing the difference between school communities and, 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 and municipalities as examples. And the politicians at some level, they're gonna start listening. Usually in our experience, there may be one or two of them that are particularly interested. 
because you know some politicians there make their career based on something related to well-being or health or or welfare of some kind and usually will garner their attention in the end and so you know effective utility of the data after we have built those teams and we had funding to work with those primary prevention specialists then it really started working well for us but this is something that takes time. There will be obstacles. There will be people that don't believe in what you're trying to do. There will be people that say, you know, why don't you just use your time on the sort of old fashioned stylish prevention activities for a week or so, and then we can move on to something else. Uh, so, you know, it takes persistence, but this is the way that this is really the only sensible way that I can see us uh, moving forward. And the, the, the positive side is that after a while, after we have done this creating of local teams and collecting of data and distribution of data and acquiring attention, it becomes the logical way to work. It becomes really illogical to go back and just do something. You wouldn't believe how happy I am to hear that. I'm the one working with surveys here. I'm the one struggling to get funding to to have national, you know, uh, representative data. And I agree with you. It's, it's a way forward to show the data. But all, I always, uh, you know, remind how hard it is to get, uh, you know, in such a, a huge country. It took us 10 years to get, you know, a, a survey with a uh, representative sample that still cannot be representative for states, only regions. So mm. that, that type of, you know, uh, strategy yeah. would be so hard in our reality because to have, you know, all those strats, it would be almost impossible uh, with the funding that, that we have. But I, I, I love to hear how much you believe that the, the data can, can generate this perception. And, uh, and, in a, and just let me say, in a society, in, a, in, a, in an environment like yours, it may probably be advisable to start with a pilot site. You, you're, you're not going to go, you know, countrywide or, or massive regional wide. We, we probably have to start with a pilot site because pilot sites, they sell if we do things well. And if we do things well at a small site, then we garner attention. Perfect, perfect. We are coming to an end. I think our our broadcast uh, in YouTube already uh, was interrupted uh, because it's a limited time. But uh, the the recording will be available for all the other uh, associates. It's in the name of Abeaji, I thank you, Dr. Christensen. It was very uh, amazing the the whole presentation, and it was very great to to hear it from you. And thank you for all for the audience and the questions and hope we could, uh, 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 you know, make you inspired to apply some of those ideas. Thank you, Dr. Christensen. For thank you very much. I appreciate time. it. We'll be in touch. Congratulations for the work. Bye-bye. Bye now.